All right, in continuing assignment two, I have my sketch. I went ahead and dropped in my inspiration Pokemon for the sketch. What's really helpful about the Pokemon designs is that even though they're pretty simple in construction, they, they pose their characters well so that the silhouette of the character, if it was just a shadow cast on a wall, really gives you a sense of what the size and shapes of that character are. And silhouette is a big term in character design in digital art. It really helps you, like Bart Simpson's silhouette is very identifiable. Uh, Marge Simpson's silhouette, Lisa Simpson's silhouette. So good character design in animation, in video games, in comics, in illustration, in children's books, what have you, has a lot to do with just the overall shape that the characters make. And so that frees you up a lot as a character designer. It's not so much about fine details. It's a lot about uh, just the structure. So that's why I really stressed sketching with the anatomy in mind. So here I have the direction of the head. So I have a, a cranium and a bill here, kind of the jaw of this Psyduck character. Well, I guess we can call it a mandible. So we have a cranium and a mandible facing this way. That is helpful to note. So on my sketch, I might even put a little arrow just to remind you guys. So the head's facing this way, which means the reference I need needs to face kind of down and to the left because light is also hitting it in that way. The chest is facing this way as well. And you can tell that from a little indicator line I put for the sternum that splits the rib cage and then the cavity underneath the rib cage, that little half arc. Simple drawing, but it really helps you understand how the body's moving. And then the collarbone, which is also lines up with the top of the rib cage, it's angled down, but you have the shoulders across like this, and that's gonna help the silhouette. This arm is reaching a little bit higher than this arm because that collarbone is tilting down somewhat. Good character design also looks like it's animated, like it's moving, so that it doesn't look stiff like an Egyptian portrait. You want to avoid horizontals and verticals. That's why we have an angle here that's going down for the collarbone, and we have an angle here that's going up between the hip joints for the pelvis. That's called contrapposto in Renaissance artwork. And it was kind of developed by the ancient Greeks in the high classical period around 500 BC in order to make their sculptures look more lifelike. So they tilt the collarbone, they tilt the pelvis in opposite ways, contra to, to each other, contraposto. And what that does is it gives a nice curve to the spine. If the spine's long enough, it gives a nice S curve. So the pelvis is facing this way, the chest is facing this way, the head is facing this way, and then the arms and legs all connect with their joints. And even though the side duck just looks like there's little duck feet glued on to a ball, you do need to kind of understand how that would work with leg joints because we're gonna be trying to make these into believable creatures. All right. So now, I was, I yeah. I had a question about, you, the, you were saying the pose of the missile is really important. Yeah. I was wondering, is it okay to like try and do the posing with like putting it into my landscape in mind? Because since I have, this is Abby, I have yeah. these cactuses. I was going to make a, like a thing that climbs on the cactus, kind of like how koalas climb on trees. So would it be okay to be like posing it like that? Or do you kind of want it to be freestanding? So that's a great question. I'll, I'll put it this way. I want it to be a good portfolio piece just on a white background. So okay. if it's going to look weird, you know, as assignment two, because there is no cactus there, yeah. then then you might think that's not as versatile as I, I want it to be. Okay, because we're going to get good enough at compositing that no matter what pose you design it in, as long as it's captivating on its own, we can make it fit into that landscape. That will be the next assignment. Okay. Whether the cactus overlaps it or not, you know, whether it's climbing it or whether it's like jumping from one of them to another, we'll get to play with all of that. But yeah, okay. just think of each one as a portfolio piece on its own. 
and I think that will serve you best. Cool. And it's, it's absolutely fine to be thinking about your landscape in decisions you make about your creature, but you're going to find that it's hard enough to find good reference that I don't want you to, to tie your hands more than you need to about what makes a good creature design. And remember, because we can composite the landscape for assignment three as well, you can always composite a new cactus or always take cactuses out or always uh, crop it differently to, to make it work better with your creature. So all of those will be considerations. Okay, thank you. Yep, good question. Okay, now the next, next stage, I have a good sense of my sketch. I have some ideas about the references. I've gathered the references into these different folders. So I have more than five for sure. I have more than five just for the head. And I marked the ones I thought were most useful green, you know, secondly most useful orange. But then as you find more reference, you get more ideas. So I'm gonna show you how we put all that together. But that means I'm ready to start bringing in uh, these source images. So to do that, I just like with our landscape sketch, I first want to bring up the resolution. So I built this at 11 by 13 inches. I'm going to go ahead and shrink that to 8 by 10 inches. Okay, But I'm going to change the dots per inch, DPI, which isn't really dots per inch. It's actually pixels per inch. Dots are the circles of ink that printers put out. Pixels are what computers see with. So the pixels per inch, I'm going to make 300. No, I, I'm not. Sorry. I'm thinking print resolution. Screen resolution, so it doesn't really slow down this browser-based program, I'm going to do 150, which is good for high-def screens. I'm going to have resample checked. And what that's going to do is it's going to grow my image so that everything I painted in digitally is going to get softened. So you can kind of see that, but that's fine. It's just a sketch. And that's true if you took a screen grab of your sketch or if you uh, did a low resolution scan of something from your sketchbook or if you just have a pretty low resolution digital camera, it doesn't matter. We're going to upscale it, which softens all the pixels and isn't great, but this is just something that is our, our blueprint, our guideline. Then I'm going to turn the rulers on, and I do that under View, Rulers, and the shortcut for that is Action Key R. Action Key for a Mac is Command, so Command R will toggle on and off your rulers. And the reason I do that is so I can use the Move tool, the one at the top of your toolbar, and just click on the ruler and drag down Guides. So these are just visual guides, and I want it to remind me where 8 by 10 inches is because this is what I want my composite to fit within. But just like if I were doing a collage project at home on my desk, I would spread out my different magazine pictures to cut from around the image, you know, around the piece of paper that I'm going to collage onto. So this is the piece of paper we're going to collage onto. Now I need to grow that desk around it. So to do that, I am going to actually duplicate my background thus far. So Command J, so that that's now a floating uh, 8 by 10 at 150 pixels per inch. If you're using Photoshop, you want to make it print quality, you can do 300 or even 350 pixels per inch, and it shouldn't slow down Photoshop at all. And then for the background, just so you understand, I'm just going to call and this background layer, I'm going to grow by going to Image Canvas Size. And I'm going to change it to Inches. And I'm going to make this uh, 30 inches wide by 40 inches tall, growing from the center. So that's a lot of space around my 8 by 10 because I might have a lot of different references. And because it's the background, I'm going to go ahead and fill it because the checkerboard can be a little annoying to look at. I'm going to say edit fill with 
gray and 100% opacity. Okay, so now I have two layers. I have my, my sketch that's eight by 10 at 150 pixels per inch. And then underneath that, I have a much bigger gray background that's 30 by 40 inches at 150 pixels per inch. Now I'm gonna start with the focal point of my creature, which is the head and take the reference I'm most sure about and bring that in. And you'll see, because I have so much space, the images will come in at real size. So I'll get a good sense of what their size potential is. And then I'm just gonna do a really rough cutout of the parts of it I think might be useful, always with a lot of overlap, right? So even if I think I'm just gonna use the top part of this head, I like that green and I like that eye socket. And I, I like the bill and how the head connects with the bill and maybe I can use that. I'm gonna get all of that with a lot of overlap with the, the feathers and background around it. So a rough cutout. And then because this is a smart object, instead of deleting everything and having to rasterize it, I'm simply gonna hit Command J or Action, action Key J. That will duplicate that rough selection onto a new layer. And then I delete the smart layer that came in. If I have auto select turned on, which I recommend for this project with the move tool, I can just click on it and kind of move it around. And so I'm going to bring all my head assets in that I think might be useful. The other head asset that's pretty useful is this one, strangely enough. I found this a little bit later. It's really high resolution, but it's a baby seal head. All of these are from Pixabay. And you can see how huge that photo is. Way bigger than I need would be perfect if I was doing something for print resolution. But I really like the eyes and kind of the spacing and the furriness of it. Not so crazy about the, the dull color. So I'm gonna, again, lasso that with lots of overlap. Just with the regular lasso tool, I don't have any feathering turned on. So I'm just taking whole pixels. And then action key J. And then delete the smart layer underneath. And then at any time I can hit control T, hold down shift so it doesn't distort. And I know I can scale that down quite a bit. I'm still working a little bit larger than my actual resolution for my sketch. Okay, and then I can use tilt and get it facing the right way. So all that's with control T and then you hit return. And I can do the same thing with the mallard. And you can see how once I get these anatomies kind of lined up in the same direction, I can say, well, I like that eye placement better than this eye placement. So I'm gonna be merging these elements. Now I tend to overdo head design because I never want it to look like um, the person knows exactly what I did to create the head. To me, that feels like a National Enquirer or, or Star Magazine kind of compositing, like Bat Boy, and it's just too obvious. So what I'll often do is customize the head with a few references all on their own. So I really like the eyes of this frog, and I like that smooth, shiny lighting on it. So I'm gonna duplicate that out, and this will be used for the head as well, or at least I'll try it out. Control T. I oh, wanna be on the right layer though. Control T. And then I wanna tilt the eyes a little bit so that they line up 